Hey everyone, it's a beautiful Friday morning and it's time for the Locked On Sports Minnesota Roundtable. That's starring myself, Ron Johnson. We got Sam Ekstrom from the Ron Johnson Show. We also have Luke Inman and Reggie Wilson from Superior Sports Talk. And we have to talk about, we, we have a topic coming up later in the show. We're going to talk about Kirk Cousins. If Kirk Cousins were to cook, because this is a game where Kirk Cousins, you got to, because Russell Wilson tried to be a chef and Russie's not cooking this year, but Kirk needs to cook. And if Kirk were to go to coach, say, coach, let me cook. What kind of cook would he be? What kind of meal would he make? It's coming up next on the round table. Locked on sports, Minnesota podcasts. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local expert. And it starts now. As I said, it's a beautiful day, everyone. This is the round table. Again, that's Sam Maxim. That's Reggie Wilson. That's Luke Inman. And it's the round table on locked on sports, Minnesota. All the hot topics, all the crazy discussions, all the things that you guys want to hear about. We might even bring up aliens because for some reason, Sam wants to get anal probed because he keeps talking about these aliens. I don't know what's going on with Sam and aliens Whoa. lately, but but Sam <laughs> wants aliens to take so over the out world of context. and talk about Kirk Cousins. I, I went to sleep last night like, why is Sam talking about... like? And, and the minute he brings up aliens, of course, every Will Smith movie possible comes on. Uh, Men in Black 1, 2, and 3 roll last night. Uh, Independence Day was on. I mean, it was just like an alien invasion in my dreams because Sam sort of, so we'll talk about aliens too. I don't know what's going on with aliens and Sam, but hey, if you want to go somewhere, go to Sam first because he clearly has something to tell you about uh, Kirk Cousins and these Vikings upon an alien attack. But, <laughs> and why would we say aliens will attack? Maybe they just want to come here and hang out, you know, and be friends with us. But, this is the Locked On Sports Minnesota Podcast Network, and we have to get into our discussion, fellas. There's a lot of hot topics. We're going to talk about the Kirk Cousins cooking because Russell Wilson sure isn't taking that role, so maybe it's Kirk Cousins' time. But this game, Lions and Vikings, and there's some stats that, that now I understand Vegas. Vegas is not slick. If you look at the offensive yards, and I think that's where they started with this line, the Vikings have uh, put up, 24.1 points per game. That's 10th in the NFL. And the Lions, 26.3. That's six. So betonline.net, I get it. I know what you guys are doing. You're looking at that two points right there. That's 2.2 points. Can't do that. So what do you do? 2.5 points. Because that's the line. And it's all about offense because the defense is both the 31st and 32nd in overall yards. So it doesn't matter. So when you're looking at all those stats, fellas, I'm going to start with you, Sam. Who's the most important player to watch in this Vikings Lions game? Yeah, I'm gonna give you a decisive answer here. No alien talk whatsoever. The answer <laughs> is Cameron Dantzler. Cameron Dantzler. Now, the way that Kevin O'Connell was speaking on Wednesday, I think that Dantzler's playing. Whether he plays every snap or not, I don't know, but I think he's playing. Um, Andrew Booth is out for the year. Uh, Caleb Evans is out for at least four games, and there's only five to go. So he's basically out for the year. Uh, so you've got Cameron Dantzler off an injury and Duke Shelley as your cornerback depth right now on one side of the field. You need Cameron Dantzler to step up. You need him to be suitable in that role if you're going to have at least adequate cornerback play, I think, going forward into the end of the year. And, of course, you're going to want – to have Dantzler healthy in the postseason. So I, I want to see how Dantzler fares coming off that injury. Can he play at a high level? Because Patrick Peterson is having a resurgent season. Chen and Sullivan's playing better. If they could get a high-end Cameron Dantzler down the stretch, dare I say the cornerback group would actually be pretty strong. So I'm watching Cam. Mm. I like that. What you got, Reggie? So I am going to go with Justin Jefferson. It seems obvious, I get it. But you look at that game last year, he had 11 receptions for 182 yards and a touchdown. This is the game for him to just break out and and keep it going because look, Detroit is scoring a lot of points, especially lately. Jared Goff says he feels like he's playing the best football of his career. And that's kind of crazy for him to say because he's not with Sean McVay anymore. And he went to the Super Bowl with the Rams. And you're like, oh, okay. But it seems like this might be a game where the Vikings are going to have to keep up with the Lions. We saw how that first game went. And so this will be a game to target Justin Jefferson early and often. 
He didn't make a whole lot of noise in that first game against Detroit this season. He didn't have to, and they still got a chance to win. Cam Dantzler, uh was in that game. But I just want to see Justin Jefferson go off. I think he's due. What you got, Luke? Yeah, well, for me, it's the health of your superstars. And I'll give you one offense, one defense, because you know, Ron, I can't just pick one guy. I'll start with Zadarius. Listen, there, there's something <laughs> wrong with this pass rush right now. And I think a lot of it has to do with the health of Zadarius. 29th in the league, bottom three in pass rush win rate as a team. And it's just obvious this guy's just not 100% right now. Dude had eight and a half sacks first eight games. He's got one the last five weeks. So something's up. In fact, I think it's time to start thinking about resting him for the playoffs. Not to mention the fact I think Patrick Jones deserves some more playing time too from what we've seen. So getting after Jared Goff Sunday, that's going to be a huge key. He's playing some of the best football of any quarterback the last five weeks in the league. Z needs to bring the heat. Offensively, Christian Derrissaw should be back this game. Last time these two teams faced, he swallowed up Aiden Hutchinson. But that was a long time ago. All of a sudden, this entire Lions defense... They're playing a lot better. So Darison needs to be that anchor out there again, coming off this concussion. You need your superstars to carry you at the end of the day. Right now, two of their best players are a little banged up. How they both play is going to go a long way, whether the Vikings can come away with a win versus Detroit in Ford Field. Well, my player to watch, I think the most important player on this field, is on both sides. It's on both sides. It's the running backs. Both sides. Both running backs on both teams. But I'm going to go with Dalvin Cook, and this is why. The Lions are giving up 149 yards per game on the ground. That's 28th in the NFL, people. There's only 32 teams out there. 149 yards on the game. If there was ever a game to slow down, slow down and keep the Lions offense off the field, this is the one. How do you do it? Successfully running the ball. Clearly, there are some holes in this Lions defense. Clearly, the, the run game can be very useful in this game to slow it down. Like, slow it down. And that's why Dalvin Cook is important. Also, what Dalvin Cook does, it doesn't allow for turnovers, for interceptions, for big sacks, big hits on Kirk. You force them to put more guys in the box, and then you can get to some of the Justin Jefferson man looks. But if you start out four wides, three wides, and you allow them to have five DBs in the game and play the game they want to play and let Hutchinson get after the quarterback, it's not going to go your way. I think Dalvin Cook is important because he can slow the game down. Time of possession is important, and I think that's why Dalvin Cook is the guy. Uh, despite the Rams win last night, how do the Vikings avoid bottoming out like the Rams did this year? Now, we do know Baker Mayfield came in. Now, I will say this. The Raiders did it to themselves. They gritted. I don't know if anybody saw it, but after the punt, mm -hmm. these idiots were grittying around the ball like, oh, that's a great punt. Let's gritty and celebrate because we're about to win this. You that is the, the equivalent of Sean Payton's skull chin in U.S. Bank Stadium right before the Minneapolis Miracle. Like, you never celebrate too early, ever. I don't care who's a quarterback. Now, I do know with Tom Brady, you don't do it. I do know that. I know with Aaron Rodgers, you don't do it. With Baker Mayfield, maybe you feel like you can do it. But, hey, you felt you, you succumbed to it, too. You idiots. You do not gritty on a – and on a punt? You didn't even punt the ball. If the punter had gritty, I get it. But anyway, that's not, this is not what we're talking about. How do the Vikings avoid ending up like the Rams and bottoming out and kind of having a rough year? And the Rams don't even get the benefit and get their draft picks because they gave those picks to the Lions. So the Lions right now are cheering for every Rams loss, which last night I know they weren't happy with. But I, but I think they hope down the stretch, Baker Mayfield can't continue to get it done. Now, if he finds a way to win the next four games, I'm going to be like, wow, Sean McVay is a genius. It's Sean McVay the whole time. It was Sean McVay. But I'm going to start with you, Luke. How do the Vikings avoid that next year? Yeah, first of all, that game last night was incredible. The biggest problem with the Rams, and they knew this was going to happen, they sold their soul for a Super Bowl. They pushed every last chip all in, mortgaged the future, and it worked. They got their ring, but now they're in the nightmare stage of that Super Bowl dream. It started with having no draft picks, no young talent to step in when the superstars they traded for are either gone or they're hurt. Seven straight years without a first-round draft pick, it's eventually going to catch up to any team. Vikings need to have a draft 
draft next year that nets at least a few impact guys. And then they need guys from this year's draft to come back and make an impact in 23 as well. Seen and Booth, obviously the easy ones, but then even guys like Brian Asamoah, a Caleb Evans, maybe even Ty Chandler. And I'm not saying every one of those guys needs to be a pro bowler, but the glue in between the cracks of your roster is what day two and day three of the draft is all about. It finally caught up to the Rams team. There's going to be a lot of pressure on the Vikings young guys to kind of develop and step up and play a bigger role here soon if they want to avoid that Rams collapse. But I think they will avoid it because, again, even though they haven't hit these drafts out of the park, no home runs, they still have a lot of young talent waiting to be developed there behind the scenes. Sam, what you got? Yeah, Luke's right. He hits on a lot of key points. The The Rams are very top-heavy. Um, then they were top-heavy last year, too. They kind of defied logic that they were able to win a Super Bowl because they lost a lot of quality starters before that season. It happened to work out. The Stafford-McVay partnership, the Kevin O'Connell influence, that all led to a Super Bowl victory. But now they're stuck with a quarterback who, and we knew Matthew Stafford had inconsistencies. He was inconsistent and now injured. And they've got some absurd contracts on that. Like, I don't know what they're operating under for a cap, but $12 million to uh, Bobby Wagner next year, $22 million for Leonard Floyd, 26 for Aaron Donald, 15 for Joseph Noteboom. Eight million for Rob Havenstein. Eight million for Tyler Higby. Shall I continue? Because there's more. I won't because it's boring. But they've just got so much salary baggage. Uh, they're going to need to make some tough decisions, and and that's where the Vikings have to make tough decisions too. They are also a top-heavy team in the salary cap. They're probably going to need to make some difficult choices to stay cap compliant, bring in some younger guys that are cheaper. Reginald. Yeah, I think they should just stay aggressive. I think the Rams problem, because my brother is a huge Rams fan still, even though they left us. Um, so their demise is my joy right about now. But um, I think the reason why they are so terrible is because, like, they have no depth. And it's to Luke's point, like, they sold their souls, man. You know, Les Snead went, you know, MJ, F them picks, and just ended up just <laughs> – giving all of it away to get guys like Jalen Ramsey and, uh, you know, it was OBJ, guy Allen Robinson. And and the problem is, is all these guys, like, are hurt and they have no depth. Like Allen Robinson on IR, you know, Matthew Stafford basically done for the season. They had nothing at the running back position. You know, th this was just – uh, like a cornucopia of terrible things happening to them. That offensive line, they lost Andrew Whitworth, porous right now. So, like, the Vikings just need to make sure they get some depth because suffering those type of injuries at so many key positions has been catastrophic for the Rams. Yeah, here's where I go with it. I I, I honestly, I think it's, it's, it's definitely injury-based. You look at the Rams, Cooper Cup. You look at Matthew Stafford. Um, I think that's one key. Uh, when you lose those two guys, Cooper Cup is that offense. We know that now when you see how uh, anemic they can be on third downs, uh, how tough it is to find a guy to get open because we understand Kevin O'Connell's offense now is a lot of choice routes, a lot of option routes. The Rams is that on steroids. Like every other route was a choice route. Uh, I talked to a couple of Vikings players about the offense and how many different variations of routes are within the route tree, which is probably why some of the Kirk Cousins throws, you're like, oh, why did he do this? And why did the receiver do that? It's because there is a choice. And if the quarterback and receiver aren't on the same page of where the guy's lining up, it's going to be a bad throw. But this is what I'll say, injury. I think injury is going to be the key to this. How healthy can the Vikings get to next year? And then I think Sam hit it. It's the contracts. Which contracts can you unload that do not matter and you do not need these players in order to make up for that gap? Because the it, to being able to sign new guys in the offseason is not so much a vet, uh, you know veteran guys to add, but even if you're signing your draft picks, like that's that's the tough thing where you're coming down to signing your draft picks and you got to find money. That's when there's a problem. So, yeah, I think some of these bigger contracts with the Vikings of guys that they're like, look, I don't know if you're worth 50 million or 40 million anymore or 30 million. Um, it's going to be some tough offseason conversations, but Kevin O'Connell's got to decide who matters most. And my guess is it starts with number 18, and then you work your way down.
Um, Here's the million-dollar yep. question, too, for Vikings fans that always gets thrown out every year. Would you take one Super Bowl win if the next decade or maybe even two decades was just garbage? Like, would you go through what the Rams are going through now times 50 for one Super Bowl? I think if you ask a lot of Vikings fans, they say, yeah, I would do it. A lot of people just want one, and that's what the Rams did. They mortgaged the future to go all in and get one. Okay, I was wondering where you are going with that, Luke. I was a little concerned because I'm like, the answer is definitely yes. Oh, no. Because it's been since 1961, there's been zero. So I'm pretty sure they would take one <laughs> and go to 2000. Like they would take one now and be okay to, to, to 2061 without getting another Super Bowl. 100%. If they got one right now. So uh, 2061, that's probably when the aliens are coming, according to Sam. Uh, so 100, would that be 100 years of the league? Yeah, that'd be 100 years of the league, wouldn't it? Yeah, 100 years of the league. Aliens the Vikings will, will have a Sam Super Bowl roster in 2061, and then aliens will invade. And in 2061, Sam, what will you be so, like? 70 something. I will be exactly 70. Yeah. See, there you go. So you'll be 70, and you'll be ready for the probe. Um, <laughs> do you ever read? <laughs> and in Minnesota, folks, we know contracts are a big deal. There's a lot of stuff going on with PJ Fleck. But before we do that, make sure you understand Amazon Fire. Roku, there's an app, download it, search Locked On Sports Minnesota, little box comes up, click it, download it to your TV, you can get all of our videos, all of our shows, you can watch Sam fall in love with an alien, all on the Locked On Sports Minnesota app, and we have a word from our sponsors. Ron, I know that you've been refreshing betonline.net all week, you just sit there at your laptop, you say, oh, the Vikings can't be underdogs in Detroit, and you just refresh, refresh, refresh until it changes. Well, it hasn't changed yet. It's still Vikings plus two, um, and you can get that line and all the other lines for the NFL at betonline.net. That's your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every league, pro, and amateur. You can also get great sports podcasts and get your betting fix in general at betonline.net. Net. Check it out on your mobile device. Bet online. It's where the game starts. Well, of course, everybody knows the news. Uh, PJ Flex signs another contract extension, keeping him as a Gophers coach through 2029. Good job, PJ. I'm excited for you. I'm happy to be. I mean, I mean, I'm wearing the shirt. I, I, I didn't do it on purpose. I just this just was the next step on the list. I just grab stuff off the top, and then I you know gets put back down, and then the next shirt goes under, and then I grab this one off the top. So whatever is up for the day, I just put it on. This was today's shirt, so I had nothing to do with PJ, but uh, PJ, congratulations. He did send me a text and invite me out to practice for the bowl week, so I definitely will uh, – might have to get the whole crew out there. Maybe just take the whole locked-on crew out there to go watch a Gophers bowl game practice. Um, but here's where I go with this question, fellas. PJ Flex contract extension, so it's a two-parter. One, was that a smart move for the Gophers? And then two, where does he rank among Big Ten coaches? And I'll start with you, Reggie. I don't know if it was a smart move for the Gophers. I, I don't know if there was just like a, a lot of pressure to get something like that done. They increased the salary according to reports um, to from $5 million to $6 million, six million a year. And I don't know if it was necessary. You know, like I feel like he had another season where, yeah, he got the ax, but it was still – kind of short of expectations of competing uh, for a Big Ten division title. And so I, I think it was I, – I, I don't know what to think about that, but I, I think, you know, congrats to him. I'm all for anybody ever, you know, making some money and all that. As far as uh, where he ranks, I was looking at this um, column on M Live, and they put him at number eight. And they put Pat Fitzgerald. They put – well, at the time, they put Paul Chris. He's not even there anymore. And then they put James Franklin. They put Brett Bielema ahead of him. So I think he's like middle of the pack, but I don't think he's as low as they put him on that list. What you got, Sam? All right. Well, number one, does the extension really matter? Like in the, in the grand scheme of P.J. Flex staying or leaving, if an opportunity comes up that he wants, he leaves and he probably gets the next school to pay the buyout. Um, and P.J. Fleck can probably stay, like, as, as long as he wants beyond this. Or, like, I mean, I, I don't I – don't, the, the extensions in college football are just kind of thrown around like candy on Halloween. Um, so I don't know if it's a good move or a bad move. I think it's sort of just getting him on the level of some of these new contracts, Matt Rule, and um, – 
you know, Luke Fickle. Where does he rank in the Big Ten? I'm not going to give any of the newcomers. I'm not going to put them above P.J. Fleck, even though they might bring in some clout and some name recognition. Uh, you know, you've got your big two. You've got your uh, your Ryan Day, your Jim Harbaugh. Then I think you got to throw Franklin in the mix. And, and really, it's hard to rank coaches. You're kind of ranking programs. So the programs that are above Minnesota, it's the big guys. And then Kirk Ferentz. I don't love Kirk Ferentz, but he continues to squeeze the most out of that Iowa program, so he would probably be in the top four. I'd put P.J. Fleck five or six. Hmm. Luke, what you got? Yeah, I, I did this exercise at the beginning of the season. I don't think uh, really a lot's changed since then. Harbaugh, Ryan Day, Jim Ferentz, Franklin, all in that first tier. Brett Bielema, Pat Fitzgerald, slightly above them in that second tier. I got PJ ahead of guys like Mel Tucker, Michigan State, Purdue, Jeff Brom, Greg Schiano, Tom Allen, and now Wisconsin, as Sam mentioned, Luke Fickle coming over from Cincinnati. Have to kind of wait and see, but he's coming over with a lot of high expectations too. But I've got PJ behind the big four, Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State, Iowa coaches and then right near the bottom of that second tier with Bielema and Fitzgerald so I'll say seventh I guess if I got to pick one at worst but with one or two good seasons coming up here he could leapfrog them and go as high as maybe fifth in the Big Ten. Bielema three-time Big Ten champ plus he's a crazy 41 and 24 in the conference. Fitzgerald was coach of the year four years ago he won the West two times in the last four years. PJ he's got one coach of the year in 2019 won the West that year too but I just think Bielema and Fitzgerald have been and doing a little bit longer, I think nine and 16 years, something like that in the Big Ten respectively. I just think people need to see P.J. put up more consecutive winning seasons before they're going to put ahead of those two and then, of course, the Big Four at the top. So this is where I'll go with it. One, yes, it was deserving. What actually happened? He was extended to 2029. He already had a contract to 2028. I think what's more important is the buyout. That's what these extensions become. They become a way for the university to feel like, you know what? If you leave, we're going to get a decent amount of money back. And if you stay, you're going to be compensated. They only gave him a $1 million raise. That was it. It's a lot of money, but it was only $1 million. When you look at the other coaches in the Big Ten and that have joined the Big Ten, got money without ever winning a game, I think that's where this comes from. And it's more so, too, when you think about all the coaching vacancies that possibly might have reached out to P.J. Fleck. This is more of his agent. He's trying to make sure they understand that. Now, where do I see him ranking? Honestly, like I put Jim Harbaugh up there. I can't give Ryan Day that respect just yet because I agree with Jim Harbaugh. He's a coach that was born on third base, thought he hit a triple. Somehow the umpire said, get your butt back to second base. Like, that, that Glenn Macy used to always tell us that. Because when, when freshmen came in after we went 8-3, and 8-4 and four, my, my, June, my sophomore year, he would tell those guys, like, look, we beat Penn State. You know, we're going to go beat whoever, which was Ohio State. Don't think because you're here and you, you're winning now with us that you hit a triple. You are just – you are you happen to be on third base. You happen to get recruited to a great program. You still got to work to get home. You still got to work. Don't think because you're on third base. You hit a triple, and I think that's that's where Ryan Day falls. So as far as PJ, I'm gonna put him in the top four. Like I just think overall he's a he's a better coach, way more injuries. If you take the injuries out this year, he probably is in the Big Ten championship. Honestly, like you take Mo's injury out, he's in the Big Ten championship. And so that's that's where I kind of put PJ. I put him in the top four. Uh, Ryan Day's got to be in there, I guess. But I, I kind of remove Ryan Day because he's living off of other coaches and just the program itself getting recruits. Um, we'll see what Luke Fickle and Matt Rule can do in the Big Ten, but James Franklin is good. Uh, Kirk Ferentz has proved, you know, sustainable within that division. And then you got P.J. Fleck and you got Jim Harbaugh. Uh, but I'll put Ryan Day, Harbaugh, P.J. Fleck, and James Franklin. Those are my top four. We got to move on to the next topic. Carlos Correa. Will the Twins pony up the money to get him? I keep seeing on Twitter where people think the Polab pocket protectors and they're not going to want to pay. Like they're all saying, oh, they don't want to pay this money because it's never going to work out. Think about all the guys that have gotten paid all this money and it never really works out. He was lightning in a bottle, him and Buxton. So can you recreate that again? Maybe because now you have a little bit more time together. Uh, you get that energy. I mean, think about the Mighty Ducks. It took the Bash Brothers time. It takes time to be sustainable. Uh, 
<laughs> going back to my Mighty Ducks reference. <laughs> so I'll start with you on this one, Reggie. Do you think the Twins will pony up the money to sign Carlos Correa? I don't know, man. I just don't see it. You know, you're talking about a guy that might command, you know, upwards of like $300 million. And I just don't see it. I don't see it. They signed Byron Buxton to that nice extension. They gave him a hundred mil. And it was just like, oh, okay. Like that, that's what we're working with here. I just don't see, you know, I guess the twins are considered to be kind of like a small market type team, even though I don't view them like that because, you know, the Twin Cities is a pretty big market to me. But you look at like what they've done and, and where they have been. And I don't know that you see them spending the type of money that some of these other teams are spending. You look at these contracts that these guys are getting, Trey Turner, Aaron Judge, Xander Bogarts, what the Padres gave him. Like, I just don't know that the Twins are in the position to pony up that money. I think it also is exacerbated by the fact that Royce Lewis got hurt last year and where they're like, oh, well, maybe we could just let Carlos Correa walk. Now, you know, Lewis is coming off a second ACL injury, and you're like, dang, man, we he was the future. We just don't know where he's going to be when he comes back. Let's get some insurance and put Correa in here. But it's just like, at what point do you say, okay, okay, too much. We can't spend that much. And I think that's where they're going to get to. Lucas, what you got? Yeah, this one's tough. I, I know they want to keep him, right? I know now that they got a taste of Correa, it's going to be hard for them to go back to what they had without him. And they've already said they're willing to pony up a massive contract, at least in retrospect to what we're used to seeing this front office spend. So I think they'll offer him a boatload of money in the Twins' eyes, but will it be enough compared to what other teams are offering him? I don't know. We know he said he's willing to take less to stay with the Twins, but it still needs to be a fair offer according to the market. And also, I think Rocco talked about how engaged he's been with everyone in the organization this offseason. Tells me he's very interested in sticking around. So it feels like if they can match the number he gets from the marketplace, they'll have a great shot of bringing him back. But again, I'm not sure that that number is going to end up being something they can match at the end of the day. Last thing I'll point out, too, Correa is not the only good shortstop on the market this offseason. Bogarts just signed with San Diego. That's one less big market team you got to compete with. Trey Turner, Reggie just mentioned, he just signed. Dansby Swanson, Jose Iglesias. Those guys could help the Twins by watering down the market a bit for Correa, or if nothing else, I guess give them a fallback option if they aren't able to keep him around. Samuel. Hot take alert. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Not only, <laughs> not only are the Twins not going to sign Correa, my opinion is that they should not want to sign Correa. Now, this isn't necessarily a knock on Correa. He's fine. 291 last year, 22 homers, 64 RBIs. Are those $300 million numbers? No, they're not. Have you ever seen this fan base actually like a guy who signs like a massive contract? No, we're too weird in this market. We get mad at these players for not performing up to an MVP standard when they sign these big deals. Look at the way they treated Joe Maurer after he signed a big contract. Um, look at the way they treated Kirk Cousins with the big contract. Like, I don't think we can handle it. We can't handle it. Not only that, I've seen how this front office operates. They have enough money for one big contract, and that's it. So do you want to tie yourself in to Carlos Correa for the next 10 years and basically not spend outside of that? That's your one guy. I would rather sign four medium players and try to build this roster, go all in on Royce Lewis, than give your one allotted big contract to Carlos Correa for 10 years. I'm sorry. I just know how they operate. I don't want to put all my eggs in that basket. I, I'm actually with you, Sam. I, I don't think he's worth the price tag from what I saw last year anyways. And I know he's got the big name pedigree going on and, and a great resume to back it up. But from what I just sat down and watched last year, 300 million, mm -hmm. 10 years, not, not you know, the, the way the twins like to do that small market business. Uh, I think I'm with you on that one. Yeah. That sounds insufferable, Sam. Like, I, I just, I can't imagine just spending that one big contract on a guy and and not signing other key pieces. I guess that's the difference between like the Twins and a team like the Red Sox, the Yankees, the Dodgers or something like that. I just 
it, it doesn't seem like you're really trying to win long term if that's your approach. You're like, oh, just take some yeah. medium guys. Let's take some lesser guys. It's like, are you going to win a World Series with that? You can hope to strike lightning in a bottle like the Kansas City Royals did over that course of that was that like two three year run that they had but now look at them they're pretty much in obscurity again i just I, it crushes well, if you sign correa it crushes your ability to put a pitching staff around him unless you're going to develop it from within this, this front office this ownership is not going to vest invest in pitching if they're already invested in correa just, so you're going to need to grow young pitchers if you do that um but we've seen them like with mauer they held on to that Maurer contract until it was expired. Then they signed Donaldson. Okay. Then they let go of Donaldson. Then they signed Correa. They've only got enough for one. I'm telling you. Well, this is where I go with it. I think that they will not. Um, I just think this is a team that continues to show that they don't really want. And it, when they did it the first time they bought them in, and then to be out of the playoffs like at that stage and how many games they were back, I just, you know, in their mind, they're probably like, is it worth the money to continue to sit here and be mediocre? And I think the answer is pitching. I think they missed the boat a long time ago trying to get Justin Verlander. Uh, clearly, he still had it. He got it done with the Houston Astros not once, but twice. Um, I, I just I just feel like you got to go get you a pitcher. I don't know how much it's going to cost. It doesn't matter, though. You know why? Because there's no salary cap. Just go spend it. You can't die with it. Like there's a billionaire out there right now in Africa building like schools and and worlds. And he's like, philanthropy is the way to go. Treat the twins as a philanthropy. Like just treat that team and this organization, this city, just say, hey, you know what? I'm giving back. By getting me a $300 million pitcher, I'm giving back to the people. I'm going to consider that philanthropy. That's what this should be. It should be a philanthropist moment. The other owners... The, the, the Lorries and the Wilfs, they should want to help pay for a pitcher because they can consider that philanthropy. We're helping out the poorish twins in their losing life the last couple of years. But I don't think they'll do it. I just think they're going to – I think what's going to happen is he's going to sign with somebody like the Astros or somewhere or the Phillies because they're getting everybody. And then the the twins media, you know, was going to say, oh, but I heard they made him a gigantic offer – and it was, you know, it was just at the edge of what he wanted. Like, they just didn't want to get over the hump. I look at this as the Adidas versus Nike. Adidas offered LeBron James $70 million and was told $100 million was the number. Nike turned around and offered the man 90 and he took it. Here's the problem. Offer the dude $100 million, It's LeBron James. Like, that's where you look at, like, players like that, just offer him the money and move on. Like, if you really want it, go do it. So, and that's what we'll see. If they really want them, they'll offer it to them. If they don't really want them, they're going to play that game and let them walk and go somewhere else for just a little bit more. And then the reports are going to come out. They did everything they could, but the cold weather here and the media sucks and da da da. da and they're going to blame it on everything but themselves. Sam, I wanted to ask you too. Like, so I'm pretty much a newcomer here and I don't necessarily understand the ins and outs like, you know, people who've been here. And I came from Cincinnati, where the Reds weren't necessarily a team that liked to spend as well. They were kind of similar. But, you know, over the years, they decided to pony up for some guys. They got Mike Moustakas. They signed Nick Castellanos. They traded for Sonny Gray. You know, Sonny's now here in Minnesota. And so they were able to actually spend a little bit and get some guys. And they were in contention the last few years, not last season, but the years before that. So, like, is it just the, the fact that the Twins just aren't comfortable doing that? Because it 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 blows my mind. Like, I know some of these owners' pockets are deeper than the other owners' pockets. So, like, you know, you don't expect – the the Royals owner to be able to spin like the Yankees owner or something like that. But like at the end of the day, they're all billionaires. Like what is with the reluctance to spin? Like you ain't going to die with it. You can't take it with you in the casket. Like why aren't they commit like the, the whole like, okay, we're just going to spin big on one player for some reason. Like my mind is just not comprehending that for like, I just can't wrap my mind around a billionaire owning a franchise and not doing everything that it takes to try to put a winning product on the field. Yeah, I can't, you know, I can't totally put you in the, the poll ads exact headspace, but they are wealthy. They're like 800 million 
you know, dollars in wealth. I don't know where all their assets are tied up, but I think they probably fell in love a little bit with the notion of, all right, this team won it kind of the the gritty way back in 87 and 91 where they just raised these guys on the cheap and they were contenders and then all the the in the 2000s you know they were the piranhas they were just these little fish that would just nibble at you um because they were all you know young cheap homegrown players and that was the model that worked for so long and it seems like they've been slow to adapt now into this decade of opulence where these bigger markets are separating themselves even further from the smaller guys and the twins haven't really caught up and they're also probably losing money with the way that the uh the pandemic played out so of late i think you can you know make a case that they're trying to still you know stay closer to to even on this team but they're so rich it shouldn't matter it should be okay to take a loss if you're a, a wealthy owner in my opinion well, here we go, fellas. We're going to move on to the next question. And before we do that, people, make sure you understand, subscribe to Locked On Sports Minnesota. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube to Locked On Sports Minnesota. You get all the videos, all the shows, all of our content, instant press conferences after every single game. You're going to also get Twins talk as we come up. You're going to get Wild talk. You're going to get Wolves talk. But subscribe to Locked On Sports Minnesota wherever you find your podcast and also on the Locked On Sports Minnesota's YouTube channel. And I got to pay out the tease, people. We're going to make this one quick. You got 30 seconds on the clock. Sam wants to get probed by aliens. And so there's a scene in the movie Baby Boy. And I'm going to I'm gonna make a reference to how we're going to get there. But there's a scene in the, in the, the movie Baby Boy. Sam needs to watch it because uh, the dude is uh, making it. He's making breakfast. And Ving, I think it's Ving Sam, Rains, don't I think this. I say it. Ving uh, Rains. But yeah, he's, Sam, making, don't do don't do he's making breakfast for his self and then his Soon to be son in law comes downstairs uh, and he's cooking an in an outfit. Uh, he's cooking in an outfit that uh, is definitely not for kids. Uh, and it's the funniest scene ever when he just looks back and is like, You want some eggs? You want some eggs, Jody? <laughs> and he's but the outfit egg. leaves like, the he, booty out. Yeah. yeah. 71% on Rotten so, Tomatoes. So here's my question. <laughs> Because we're we're we're, we're going to talk about aliens, but I'm going to skip over the alien part. We'll we'll do we'll save that for next week with the aliens. Uh, but if Kirk Cousins were to be a cook, because we saw her let Russie cook and Mister Unlimited and the blindfolded sandwich maker, uh, thirty seconds on the clock. If uh, Kirk Cousins were to be a chef, what meal would he make, and what would he be wearing? So Kirk would have on a turtleneck because that's just <laughs> on brand for him at this point. He'd be cooking in a turtleneck and an apron. And uh, he would cook steak and potatoes, but like it would be like a baked potato where like you put your own stuff in it because like I just don't know that it would be up to par with the level of a baked potato that you would get from like a pristine restaurant. And then on his steak, like he's cooking in medium, but he only used like salt and pepper. Like he didn't do anything fancy with the butter, the rosemary and all that stuff that you see on these fancy restaurants. Like he just, you know, real basic. It'll get you by. It's a good meal, <laughs> but like it ain't real fancy. You know what I'm saying? Fly on by. Sam, what you got? What kind of meal Kirk Cousins cooking? Yeah, Kirk Cousins has a custom apron that says, you bite that. <laughs> and he's oh, we've seen him struggle to with that <laughs> with, oh my god i mean from when ron asked it um he we've seen him struggle with the grill before there's the viral picture of the the odd looking meat on the like he's he's not really a meat guy um i think he's going with some some like olive garden fare like it's very basic italian it's like gluten free pasta with red sauce and not a lot of seasoning, and some garden salad on the side, and some, like, dry biscuits. What you got, Luke? Dang. Back to you now. <laughs> it, it, you know, I, it, Kirk doesn't like the pressure. Don't bring in the filet mignon or the nice cut of protein. He's a Midwest boy. Keep it classic. Keep it simple. He's going to put that tater tot hot dish in the oven. 32 minutes at 350. <laughs> pull it out. Simple, safe. Doesn't want the pressure or the spotlight. And he knows he can do that. I think that with the apron, like uh, Sam and Reggie said, I think that with the apron and the turtleneck, that's a good look for Kirk. I like it. I like it. Well, I am going to go with Two types of Kirks. There's two Kirk cookers. The Kirk that wins games, <laughs> he's cooking butt naked. 
butt naked. The kids are off though. The kids are at grandpa and grandma's. He's cooking butt naked with a with an apron. I do like the you bite that apron. Uh, so he's cooking with the apron on, but he's butt naked, and he's making like whatever he's making. He's seasoning it like this, like he's salt baying it. Like that's the Kirk that wins. <laughs> Kirk that loses. He's smacking the meat. Just smacking he's it. Smacking like, the meat. Bait. He's slicing yeah. it with feeding Julie Cousins, you know, with the knife. Like he's pouring wine in her mouth. Uh, I mean, Jeez. but the loser, Crap, Kirk Cousins, goodness. Dan Orlovsky <laughs> talks about he doesn't use seasoning. That's the losing Kirk Cousins. Like it's an unseasoned chicken breast that hasn't been washed. It's just thrown in a pan, put in oh, the oven no. at three fifty. <laughs> Uh, unwashed chicken breast. It looks it looks like bland, and looks like some old person's feet. And there's no seasoning to it. Just in the oven at 350. Aww. Takes it out, what? and the carrots are just boiled. Nothing on them. Oh, and then no. a little bit of asparagus as well. That's like been sitting in the oven next to the chicken. Like that's that's this the two is, different. This is a cups. prison meal. This is what you eat in jail. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so what? The two, so and, what? Chef and when cousins he, and when he's, is going to show up in detroit and that's what Sunday. we got to figure out i i'm hoping okay. it's the 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 apron butt naked <laughs> one with the nfc north he'll have the nfc north shirt but he'll have it cut yeah. like hawk hogan so he can rip it off when he gets yeah. home like i that's need him to have some to go. lowry's you gotta go get some lowry's he in doesn't there. even have lowry's some, some tony, some well, uh, tony yeah when he's saturated. cooking when he's cooking he does when he's cooking he's got the lowry's okay. but yeah that's the only two kirk cousins and when he's cut when he loses his outfit is a snowsuit like he comes in from shoveling his own snow because the neighbors aren't shoveling the snow when he loses, and he's coming in straight from the snowsuit straight to the oven to finish cooking for Julie because she's just sitting back disgusted at what he did this week. Like, did you really throw four interceptions? I can't believe you. Get in there and cook. Um, <laughs> but the last that. one, Mm-mm. the Healthy last marriage. one, people. Uh, we always have a game. This this week's game is more of a, a bet online dinette type game. It's an over under. Fellas are going to have 30 seconds on the clock to explain. I got four easy ones, fellas, over, under. First one, Jared Goff and Kirk Cousins combined for 650 yards passing. Are you going to take the over or the under? 650 yards passing between Kirk Cousins and Jared Goff. Start with you, Sam. Under. Um, that's a lot of yards. Ooh. That's a lot of yards. I know Kirk Cousins is eight and two against the the Lions all time. He's had a four hundred yard game against them before, but mm-hmm. I, I'm counting on at least one of the quarterbacks to have just a medium day. That they're not both going to have stellar games. I'm taking the under. Let's go with you, Luke. What you got over under? That is an insane amount of yards, Ron. But you know what? They just made Mike White and Mac Jones look like pro bowlers. Mike White just put up 369 yards last Sunday. Vikings and this bend but don't break defense, they give up a lot of yards. We know the over-under started at 53. I think it's hovering around 52 right now. It could be a shootout, and Kirk Cousins is going to have to throw his way. Uh, and, and it could be a game where, really, who's ever got the ball last wins this game. But 650 yards is a lot. And I'm going to take the over just knowing what the defense has done the last few weeks and given up so many air yards. And we know Kirk with JJ and all those weapons can keep up and go toe to toe. Reggie, what you got? Yeah, I'm with Luke here. I think it's the over. I look at that game last Mm. year. Kirk went 30 for 40, 340 yards with two touchdowns. He had a 116.7 passer rating. That was last year. He really hasn't done close to that this year as far as like a a yardage standpoint. But I think to Luke's point, yeah, with Mike White and Mac Jones throwing for 300 plus yards in back to back weeks and with the success that the Lions offense has had, Jared Goff says he feels like he's playing the best football of his career. Like he's going to be tossing it around the field. And I think Kirk Cousins is going to have to keep up. I said JJ is going to have a big game, needs to have a big game. So like I can see him shooting it out with Jared Goff in Detroit. Hmm. Goff might I'm going to go with the under. I'm going to go with the under. I don't even I don't even need time on the clock. I'm going with the under just because I think there's going to be a run day for Dalvin Cook. Uh hopefully the Kevin O'Connell mm-hmm. finally gets the run game he's been looking for. I'm going to go with the under. Here's another one. Rush total between the two teams. Lions and Vikings. Total rush yards. 210 yards over under Reggie. I'll take the over. Jay Swag Daddy is having a season to remember up there in Detroit. 
him and Swift are a nice little two-headed monster. And then Dalvin and Madison are a nice one-two punch as well. In that game last year, Dalvin didn't play. Uh, Madison had 22 carries for 90 yards. Like he's shown that he could be a guy and combine him with Dalvin. If you really think, Ron, that Dalvin is going to have a big rushing game, he is top 10 in mm-hmm. the league in rushing yards right now. So those two together, Dalvin also this week said that he feels really good. His body is feeling good. And we haven't seen him complete a full 17 week season in his career yet. So he's trending towards that right now. So give him the ball, give him the workload. Between both teams, I could see it going over 210. Sam, what you got over under 210? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go over, and I'm putting it on the shoulders of DeAndre Swift. Now, remember, he got hurt Ooh. in the first Vikings-Lions game when he was on a tear. Missed three weeks, came back. They've been easing him in, like five, six carries a game. Last week, he bumped it up to 14 against Jacksonville. I think they're going to give him a bigger role now. If he can recapture what he had early in the season, that could get the Lions on a big rushing day. I think that the total then will be over. Lou? Mm. Yeah, this is tough because I just took the over on 650 passing yards. But, you know, I I look at Madison and Cook, like Reggie said, and Swift and Jamal. You could argue there's a case to be made. This is the number one and number two teams with a one-two punch at running back. And remember, the Cowboys kind of laid out the blueprint how to beat this Vikings defense. And it all started with controlling the line of scrimmage. You just know Dan Campbell wants to play some bully ball. He's got the offensive line and running game to do it offensively. And I think between those two and then Again, Cook and Madison, uh, they usually always go off against Detroit and this soft defense. I think you go over uh, that, what would you say, 210? I'd take the over. Yep, 210. I'm going to go over as well because Kirk Cousins is going to have him another 18-yard scamper. So I'm going to go with the over because Kirk's 18 yards (laughs) is going to help. Um, next one, TJ Hawkinson's coming back home. And he told me on the audible, I, I sat down with him and David Blau, uh, go to Vikings.com and check that out. That's the audible. Uh, it's a sit down with myself, Paul Allen, TJ Hawkinson and David Blau. And I asked him, I said, what are you planning on doing if you have a big game against the lions? And he definitely said, I'm wearing the chains on the plane. And I'm taking my shirt off. Um, I'm going to have my, my, my hair is going to be slicked back with Miller light. Uh, so TJ Hawkinson is, uh, he's feeling it. So nine targets. Over, under. TJ Hawkinson, let's go with you, Luke. I think he's got 50 targets in the last four weeks. I think he's averaging about 11 or 12 targets per game. Knowing that it's in Detroit, knowing obviously this is going to be an emotional kind of revenge game for him, knowing KOC, like we've talked about all week, is going to try to get a game plan going and feed him the ball in certain situations. I'll take the over on nine, if nothing else, given just the last three, four, five weeks, the history of how much Kirk Cousins has looked for TJ Hawkinson in the passing game. I'll say over nine. Reggie. Yeah, I'll take the over as well. He's back in Detroit, feeling good in this old building. I, I say over by a few. Oh, okay, Sam. Yeah, I'm going to take the under. I, I think that when you get traded from a team, then the team that traded you, they're not going to let you burn uh, burn them when you return. I think that they will be very conscientious of TJ Hawkinson. They know his strengths. They know his weaknesses. They know how to defend him. Uh, I think that that will repress his total a little bit. I think he scores. I think they get him a touchdown. I don't think he gets targeted nine times. All right, last one real quick. Dalvin Cook, 22 rushing attempts. That's 22 rushing attempts in this game versus the Lions. Start with you, Sam. Hmm. So that would match, I want to say, his season high, if not exceed it, because he had been 20 or below pretty much every game until, I want to say, last week or the last two weeks. So for that reason, I'm going to go under. I think that if Mm -hmm. if it'd be a season high to go over, I'm going to stick with the averages and go under. Luke. Yeah, I'm going to take the under as well for two reasons. One, I think they're going to want to use Alexander Madison quite a bit as a change of pace, use Dalvin Cook out in the passing game a little bit more. Um, And then two, if the Lions get out to an early lead, Vikings are going to have to try to keep pace and pass this ball a little bit more. 22 rushes is a lot, and I don't expect this to be quite the ground and pound game. I think both teams are going to air it out, especially in the second half. I'll take the under. Reggie. Yeah, I take the under as well. I just think that it's going to be a heavy passing game. I would love to see 22 uh, attempts from him, but I just don't see it happening. Well, the fact that I like the house's money, I'm going to go with the over just because everybody's betting on the under. 
I'm just gonna play the play the ponies. I'm going with the over. I hope Dalvin Cook is 23 carries. I hope that means one, the Vikings have gotten a lead and they're trying to slow the game down. The first lead they've gotten and maybe sustain it a little bit and uh try to try to bleed it out because Dan Campbell, we know coming from behind, they haven't had to they haven't really understood how to get it done. And so maybe that'll make them panic a little bit because the Jacksonville game, they were very comfortable. So I'm going to go with the over just because I hope Dalvin Cook is salting the game away and just trying to bleed it out and let that clock run, go that four-minute offense, and Dalvin Cook gets his 23 carries. Uh, but that'll do it today for the roundtable on Locked On Sports Minnesota. I want to thank everybody who continues to like, share, comment, download. Let us know. You know what today's topic today? Let us know what you think about Kirk Cousins. What kind of cook would he be? What meal would he make? That's today's topic. I want you guys to tweet it. Instagram comment, let us know if Kirk Cousins was a chef and if they're letting Kirk cook, what meal is he going to make in your mind? I want to thank you and have a great day.